the content. It's going to be great. Um, the talk today, unlikely allies, um, how HR, come on in, how HR can build, help you build a security first culture. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to this. I know that it's a bit of a hard sell, actually, HR at a security conference. So bear with me. Um, and I'll let you decide at the end of the session whether actually my discipline can bring anything to yours, okay? And uh, feel free to vote publicly on the interwebs about whether or not I have things to help. Um, to start with, who am I? Who am I, actually? You all know research. Who am I? Rushing my heart. Oh, oh, all right. Not only research, but we've dug a little into the bio. I like it. Yeah. Does anyone know my name? Allison, absolutely. Okay, great. This, you might have realized this isn't your typical security talk. There's going to be a lot of audience participation. Okay, great. My name is Allison. Um, I'm the head of people um, at a company called Screen. Has anyone here heard of Screen? Fabulous. That's very exciting. Two out of uh, 40-ish. That's great. Okay. No worries. We'll get to that. Um, today, uh, I look after hiring um, and human resources for a team of about 60 people Okay, in Paris and in San Francisco. Um, I am neither French nor American. Does anyone know where I'm from? Australia. Yeah, you just got you got to be quick. Yeah, thank you. You picked the accent. I've tried hard to get rid of it, um, but it just sticks. Okay, coming in. So indeed, I am Alison. I am Australian. I am from a suburb called Cherrybrook. Who here has been to Cherrybrook? Nobody. Of course, nobody has been to Cherrybrook. Cherrybrook is a very tiny suburb in the northwest of Sydney. Um, I spent the first 15 years of my life there, come on in, convinced that nothing of any consequence would ever happen to me. Okay, so that's Cherrybrook for you. Um, gives you a lot of time to imagine things, okay, and to uh, basically work a curious mind. Um, I left home at 18. Um, I traveled the world. I ended up in France about eight years ago, um, and I've been working for Screen for about a year and a half. Um, so what is Screen? Screen is security without the hassle. Okay, we do application security management. Okay, AppSec, I don't think I need to go much further given where we are. Um, if you're curious about it, however, feel free to ask me. Um, have a look on the internet afterwards. Um, so why is a HR person talking at a security conference? Any ideas? It's important. Because it's important. This is it. I like this. I like this. Last minute edition with the right answers. This is what we like to see. Okay, because it's important. HR is important. Okay. Yeah. Why else? Okay. People are? What? Okay. Okay. Absolutely. The key part. Yeah. Why else? Okay. To enforce. Did you use the word enforce? Oh, we'll come back to that. I like it. Yeah. In fact, that's, that's why I got into this gig, to enforce things. Perfect. Yeah. Um, also, maybe just not enough speaker applications this year, right? A little bit thin on the ground for uh, <laughs> pentesters, yeah. Something like that, something like that. Um, so I wasn't sort of born to be a HR person, right? I didn't sort of, you know, run out of high school saying, you know, let me at those healthcare forms and payroll and, you know, hiring people all the time. That's going to be exciting. I actually don't have a passion for HR as such. Um, my friends and colleagues often say to me, hey, Alison, wow, you're the head of people. You must really love people, right? Wrong. Um, I actually don't like people very much at all, um, but I am fascinated by them. Okay, What keeps me in my job is trying to understand all of the small, tiny, intricate combination of things that motivate people to do the things they do. Um, and they do a lot of things, right? You've seen some things, I imagine, that people have done, right? Yeah. Why? Whether that's to do with consequences or the judgment of others coming in or whether they do things for personal gain or out of moral obligation, my life's work is basically to understand why and therefore to help predict and maybe shape some of those behaviors. Um, from a very young age, I've been observing power structures around me um, and trying to find out where the boundaries are. Um, I mentioned I grew up in Cherrybrook. Cherrybrook is a very small uh, suburb outside of Sydney. Um, and in 1989... My sister and I, with my parents, moved into a house um, in a street that was just dirt. Okay, Australia, compared to European countries, we went from dirt to um, bitumen. We didn't go through the cobblestones. Okay, can imagine my shock when I arrived in Europe, sort of eight years ago. What are these things? Okay, um, so basically, we, lit my sister and I, grew up um, in this fairly quiet street. You were more likely to cross a horse coming in without a rider than you were to cross a car. Um, so my sister and I were allowed to ride our bikes out the front of our house while mum was inside doing something else. Um, 
But we had lines on our driveway, three segments, Pebble Creek. The second line was the limit. Okay, We were allowed to ride our bikes as much as we liked as long as we didn't go across that second line. Um, now, there are lots of different types of people in this world. Um, my sister is a rule follower. Okay, Succeeds very well in traditional environments. Okay, Excellent at academics. Um, does the right thing. Okay, Very important to her that she does the right thing. So, um, if the line was here, my sister would stay a good half meter back from it to make sure she didn't accidentally touch the line with her bike tire. Um, me, on the other hand, um, at the age of two, I was, I was fairly convinced that this line might have been a construct, uh, not actually a boundary. Um, and so I would ride my bike, my tricycle at the time, um, up to it and just kiss the line with my bike tire. And then I would wait. I noticed that nothing actually happened. And so the next time I would go just a centimeter over the line, same thing. The earth went on turning. And so apparently I abandoned this inch by inch uh, iteration and one day just abandoned the tricycle and went and sat in the middle of the road. My sister ran inside to see my mom and said, yeah, mommy, mommy, Allie's in the road. And my mom said quite reasonably to my older sister, why didn't you get her off? And my sister said, well, because I'm not allowed past that line. Um, <laughs> I was punished. Um, it was the late 80s. I was uh, smacked, uh, which I rightfully deserved, um, sent to my room and told that it was okay. We didn't have to tell my dad. Um, my sister had also been briefed, bribed, um, and told that I'd been punished and we didn't have to tell my dad. Um, dad gets home uh, from his uh, day of work at the bank. I've started to understand something. I've understood that actually maybe I'm not the one who risks to be in the most trouble here. But something else is at play. So when Dad walks in the door, I triumphantly scream from the top uh, level of our, uh, of our house, I've been on the road today, Daddy. Um, what ensued was a, a, a fairly loud discussion between my parents. And from that day on, I kind of understood that maybe, you know, there are different things at play than just the rules that parents give their children. Um, so, I, 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 so I got into HR, basically. <laughs> Who here already works closely, like, day-to-day -day with their HR team? Anyone? Okay, excellent. On something other than recruitment? Yeah, okay, excellent. What are you working with your HR teams on? Security awareness. Security awareness, excellent. All right, you're going to be able to teach us some things, I think. And things like onboarding. Okay, onboarding. Organizational structures. Okay, great. Org structures, onboarding, yeah. What else? Email attachment analysis, so that's HR saying, hey, we got a thing, can you check it out? Yeah, absolutely, that's a good good point. Okay, perfect. I think there's basically, so actually most of you didn't raise your hands, right? Do you know who your HR teams are? Yeah, do you know how to find them? Right, you work in security, like you can find anyone? Yeah, okay, perfect. If you had to, right, you could track them down. Perfect, by the end of the talk, I hope I've convinced you to go and like have a conversation with them. Um, for me, I think there are three reasons why security and HR teams can learn from each other and probably should work more closely together. Um, the first one is because we're basically doing the same job. Okay, hear me out. Um, HR and software engineering and HR and security actually isn't all that different. Um, my main job today is to design systems and processes and architect organizations hoping for predictable, repeatable results that can scale. Okay, not unlike the job of a software engineer. Except when you're architecting, architecting backends of applications, you usually don't have to keep in mind um, the hidden agendas of your AWS machines, for example. Okay? When you're architecting for people, totally different ballgame. Okay? Every, you, you can predict about 10% of what people will do in a system, which is fun. One of the things that makes HR people really successful is their ability to see around corners, to predict edge cases, to anticipate and mitigate risks, and always, always prepare for the worst case scenario. Okay, if that sounds familiar. <laughs> Basically, it makes us good at our jobs and really average to talk to at parties. Okay, we're always just sort of saying, yeah, if that DJ plays that next song, things are going to go terribly, I'm out of here. The second reason I think that you should speak to your HR team regularly if you work in security um, is, as you mentioned, security, it's a people problem, right? Okay, um, and HR understands people. The weakest link in any system, the human factor. Um, who here has a good definition for social engineering? Who has our definition for social engineering? Let's not set the bar too high, it's early. Yeah. Uh, personally, I think uh, maybe manipulation in human behavior. Okay. 
Okay, all right, I like it. Manipulating people to do things, um, potentially things that are illegal or things that are not allowed. Absolutely. Um, a nice definition I like um, for social engineering is the art, or better yet, the science of skillful, skillfully maneuvering human beings to take action in some area of their life. Um, this is literally my job description. Okay, and the next time I'm hiring for my team, I'm just literally going to put that sentence and say, who does this? Okay, who's good at this? Um, I spend my days convincing candidates that actually working for um, a Series A startup uh, in Paris is much better than working for any other company anywhere in the world. Okay, I convince my managers that maybe changing the way they want to communicate for a way that would be effective to communicate is a great idea. I sometimes plant seeds of ideas in leaders' heads so that a couple of months later, when they come out with a great new initiative, it is the thing that we should do and not the thing they maybe first wanted to do. Um, and then I try and understand how people in the team respond to praise versus feedback versus reward. The skills required to be effective in HR are very similar to the skills required to be an effective social engineer. What's the difference between HR and social engineers? Oh, nice. The intention. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very diplomatic way to put it. Absolutely. What I've written on my slide here is one uses their power for good. <laughs> but I won't tell you which. Okay. Nice. Um, we know that social engineering by its very nature, um, encourages users to step outside of a normal process or procedure. Okay. So it's not that we didn't have a process or procedure. It's that we managed to circumvent it. Enlisting HR to help you understand and predict specifically what might motivate person A or person B to deviate from that system can be helpful. Um, does uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with um, the vishing uh, attack uh, where basically a woman calls up trying to change the password on her uh, husband's mobile phone account and plays crying sounds of babies in the background, okay? So understanding who would be susceptible to which sort of manipulation is something that HR is pretty good at. Um, we will, for example, in my daily life, if I need to have a difficult conversation with one of the engineers, and there is myself, our director of engineering, our CTO and co-founder, available to do that conversation, what we'll choose, who, who takes that conversation, will depend on the person in front of us. If it's somebody who needs to feel like they're very, very valued by the organization in order to hear the hard feedback, we'll send the CTO and co-founder. If it's someone who needs to feel like we're sort of all in this together and they've got allies in this, then we might send me, okay, because I'm a little bit less um, organizational, a little bit less uh, top leadership to talk in there. So figuring out who will respond best to what and also what the risks are. Um, also in interviews, there are certain members of the team who I wouldn't necessarily put in interview alone with a candidate, okay, because of the messages they give off, because of what they're uh, susceptible to influence. And uh, somebody up the back mentioned that HR come to you often to check their email attachments. Absolutely. Some users, by design of their job role, are just inherently more likely to be exposed to certain attacks. Okay. Um, so our job of HR and recruitment basically is to receive emails and LinkedIn messages from people we don't know with attachments Okay, that are usually PDFs. And it's usually in our best interest to open them. Okay. So that's something similarly finance teams. So your support teams you might traditionally think have the least security knowledge and they're the most at risk, okay? So it's important to be having those conversations. The third reason I'd say HR and security teams should work together is that HR um, spends a lot of time trying to design human systems that won't provoke unwanted behavior. So a, a few illustrations here. Does anyone here use KPIs? Yeah, knows what a KPI is, okay, OKRs. Yeah, okay. Any other acronym uh, for uh, trendy things that came out of Google? Yeah, okay. The idea behind KPIs or okay, does, does everyone know what I'm talking about when I say KPIs? Okay, so like goal, like smart goals, if you will, if we're, if we're still in the early 2000s. Okay, so basically a way of designing objectives that we can quantify and easily measure success against. It's not a bad idea in theory. Um, do they work well in practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it depends is about the most positive answer you can get, right? When you ask about OKRs and KPIs, right? Is it a good system if the answer is always it depends? Probably not, right? So does anybody know much about the Australian Ambulance Association? Fair. Are there any other Australians in the room? All right, that's fine. Totally fine. Nobody's worried. All right, great. 
So the Australian Ambulance Association, um, what do you think their main job is? Why do they exist? What's the reason for being? Yeah, so they're the, basically they control all the ambulances in Australia. It's not a trick question. They're there to save lives. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. They're not a hmm? They're not a lobbyist. They're not a lobbyist group, correct. Indeed, they are actually just doing the work. Yep. Um, probably, probably also, you know, a little bit political, but they're doing the work. So the Australian Ambulance Association, basically, are, their one goal, their reason for being is, you know, basically to make it so that less people die. Um, they decided to borrow from the private sector, um, and they wanted to look at basically some efficiency measures that they could put in place. Um, they basically tracked their stats, um, and they noticed that when they attended to uh, an emergency call, within nine minutes, that the outcomes were drastically better. Okay, outcomes in this case meaning less people die. Okay, we're not talking about bottom line revenue. We're not talking about bugs in an application. Okay, we're talking about less people die. Better outcomes if you respond to a call in under nine minutes. So they thought it would be better if we respond to more calls in under nine minutes. Okay, and one of the ways they thought they would do that was to explicitly say that, okay, we can't improve something that we haven't aimed towards, so okay. Let's tell all the ambulance drivers that they are to respond to calls from the moment it hits them from dispatch in under nine minutes. Okay. In order to incentivize this, um, they said that basically the teams, the ambulance teams who respond to the most calls in under nine minutes, who have the best stats on their KPIs, get to choose which shifts they work. Okay. Ambulance working, as you can imagine, um, accidents never stop, so they work around the clock, weekends, nights, okay? and basically it's very attractive to be able to choose when you work. Um, after a month of this system, they measured the results, and they saw that they had indeed increased the number of accidents that they attended to in under nine minutes, which was excellent. That was the goal. They also noticed a spike around 18 minutes, and around 27 minutes, which they previously never had before, um, and an overall spike in the death toll. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. Um, does anyone have an idea of what might have been happening there? Okay, yeah, absolutely. So they were focusing on individual goals, which is my truck receives the call, I have nine minutes to respond. Ambulance drivers were arriving close to the scene of an accident and seeing on the clock that they would arrive at 9 minutes and 10 seconds, for example. So they were rejecting the call, sending it back to dispatch, and it was going back out to another truck who then had 9 minutes back on the clock, who would do the same thing, and so on. <laughs> it sounded like a good idea, right? It sounded like a good idea. But because of the human factor and because of the motivations that they had and because of the short-sightedness by design of the system, these ambulance drivers, they do this work because they want to save more lives, right? The system didn't put them in a position where that wasn't in conflict with their personal goals. Thankfully, most of us are not necessarily doing work that has such high stakes, okay? What we're doing is important. Internet security is extremely important, and as we saw in the keynote this morning, can have real-life human consequences. That said, most of the time when we're setting KPIs for our security teams, for our engineering teams, we have a little bit more room for error, which thankfully, okay, thankfully. What we try and do in HR is make sure that we don't have too many of those systems that produce the wrong result, okay? It's one reason why at Scream we don't have variable salary for anyone in the team, okay? Theory of variable salary, um, if you achieve your goals, you will be paid more money. Um, I do recruitment as part of my job. If you say to me, hey, Alison, at the end of the month, you'll have more money if you recruit 10 people this month. Who thinks I'll recruit 10 people this month? Yeah, oh, the rest of you are not that convinced I can. All right, nice. Thanks, team. Thanks, team. I'll have 10 people by the time we're done. Um, yeah, I'll recruit 10 people. Um, the right people? Well, maybe not. Will they still be here in six months? Probably not. Um, doesn't matter. I did the thing. It was very measurable. Okay, so then you start to say, okay, Alison, let's get a bit smarter. You're going to recruit 10 people this month, and after 18 months, 90% um, of those 10 people will still be here. All right, so at which point are you paying me this variable and what's happening month over month and do we have the predictability? Will we always hire 10 people per month? What happens if somebody leaves because of something someone else controls and not me? Okay, at what point can I impact this? Okay, and then we kind of abandon it. So we don't pay anybody a variable salary at screen because we think that it doesn't actually produce the right results. We think it can tend to be a distraction. What we do do, however, is what I call backward-looking bonuses, okay? You know when you sign up to work for screen what you will be earning, okay? 
um, you know that uh, we're a high-performing organization, that you'll do your job, uh, you'll be paid, okay, that's the, that's the agreement. That said, if you have a particularly exceptional quarter, um, there's nothing that stops us from saying, hey, um, here's something you weren't expecting, have a little extra. And that becomes an actual bonus as opposed to a, you know, there's this room for maneuver and maybe we'll give you 87.5% of your variable. It's not, not very motivating. If we agree that HR and security teams should work together, do we agree? Are we starting to agree? Does my tone imply that it's not a choice? Yeah, okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, so we agree, we agree that HR and SEC teams should work together. But now let's concentrate on the how, okay? So how should they work together? Um, you mentioned earlier by raising awareness, okay? One particularity um, about screen in the security industry is that we refuse to market or to sell fear, okay? So we do not capitalize on public breaches to sell our SaaS. Okay, just let that sink in for a minute because it's quite unusual in the industry. We don't market or sell fear, um, which means internally, when we're raising awareness about security, we have a unique challenge, which is we will not spread fear to our employees either. How do you educate people about security without fear? Make it fun, I like it. Okay, challenges and competitions. Okay, make it engaging, make it educative, make it, yeah, make it fun. Okay, absolutely. Those are some of the things we do. One of the first things we do basically is to give concrete real world examples of attacks so that individuals can understand how they happen, okay? How and why they work. What that helps to do is to distance people from the, you'd have to be uh, stupid to click on a phishing link, okay? What we basically do, our CTO says, hey, um, you know, here is a spear phishing attack that I once received. He said, and I clicked on the link. Okay, I'm the CTO and co-founder of a security company, and absolutely happens to everybody. Here's why, okay? And here's why it doesn't have to be this big shameful event if it does happen. Basically, we give them awareness, common attacks, how and why they work, and the most important, which is an avenue for recourse if something looks suspicious or if you think you've done something. In our onboarding, we have a slide, which is our CTO's personal phone number, um, and the words underneath it, which says, if you have a doubt, call me. If it's 3 a.m., I would rather be woken up for nothing than for you to hesitate and not want to bother me, okay? And that's pretty powerful uh, you're on the first date. Maybe when there's five of you in the team, okay, logical. When we start to be 50, 60, two different time zones, two different continents, that starts to be a powerful message. So if we onboard a, a junior sales development rep in San Francisco, they get this training. They get JB's personal phone number, and they get the call me if in doubt, okay? And a few of us have done so. So... Um, we also give guidelines to our specific teams. So our sales team travel a lot, okay? So um, we're basically very careful about physical security. So things like ciphering their laptop, okay, using privacy screens in the train, custom host names, not connecting to public Wi-Fi, things like that, that sales people who are trying to close a deal just want basically anything so that the paperwork can go through, um, keeping their browsers up to date. Um, one effective awareness, fun, educative challenge, competition, if you will, that we use at Screen is the cookie method. Okay, this will not be new to a lot of you. Um, basically, if your laptop or another device is left unattended and unlocked in the Screen house, which is our offices, um, screeners, the people who work there, stay with me, it'll be easy. Um, screeners are allowed to access that device and write cookies on the general Slack channel or send an email to the company. Okay, you're told about the cookie method on your first day at Screen. Okay. The two hours maybe that elapsed before that first meeting is the only time that you're immune, um, and otherwise, up from that day forward, okay, no device. Doesn't matter if it's your telephone, doesn't matter if it's your laptop, you don't leave it unlocked and unattended, otherwise somebody will cookify you, as we have made it uh, a verb. We've gotten pretty creative about the cookie method, okay, we're a security company, most people, you know, they stand up to go to the bathroom, they lock their computer, right, it's, it's not that hard, so you have to get a bit creative, um, because we're a big fan of cookies. Feel free, come on in. We're talking about cookies of the eating kind. Come on in. Um, so one person in our San Francisco team uh, sustained a, a cookie attack because three members of the team basically uh, fired Nerf guns um, at him repeatedly. He ducked below his desk to take cover, leaving his laptop, and somebody else came in and wrote cookies. <laughs> Second uh, attack vector, okay, the Apple Watch skateboard event that we still refer to. Um, so if you have a Mac near a paired Apple Watch, you can unlock it. Um, you feel the vibration on your wrist, of course, but when you're trying out a brand new skateboard around the office that your colleague has just said, hey, Yanis, want to take a tour? You might not notice, okay? 
So running behind, picture this, someone running behind someone on a skateboard, <laughs> trying to unlock and write cookies at the same time. Um, the sales team often take a, often like to walk around the office while they're closing deals. Okay, so one team member was behind the screen, um, the glass door out to the patio on his phone, um, closing a customer with his laptop outside, but he'd left his Bluetooth keyboard inside. So no visual markers. This was quite an impressive one. Okay, so command space to open spotlight on Mac. Slack enter. Command K general and enter to switch to the general channel. Type cookies and enter with no visual feedback whatsoever. Okay. And one screen, his girlfriend actually cookified him when he went to the bathroom at home while working from home. Okay. She doesn't act, she doesn't work for us. Um, but this <laughs> culture has spread beyond. Um, and when all of us went, Loic? How did Loic get cookified, you know? And uh, his girlfriend uh, claimed. Uh, so we started to go beyond the first circle, right? And the security is getting larger and larger. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're rewarded for your hard work, always, always. And it's become quite the competition now. Um, we're a big fan of uh, cookies. We're a big fan of food. We like to cook. So each time somebody is cookified, the challenge is to raise the level of what gets brought in. Okay, so it's started to get a little bit ridiculous. Um, I'll have it known that in uh, 16 months working at Screen, I have never once been cookified. <laughs> that is a challenge. <laughs> My laptop is here. It is not connected to the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, beyond that, uh, we also do security-themed hack nights at Screen, where a member of the team basically takes two days and prepares a security-type challenge for all of us to work on for sort of three hours at night. Um, one of them, my favorite one, was um, learning how to execute a DDoS attack. Um, I got into security um, very much by accident. Um, I was teaching English uh, to a lot of people in business in France when I first moved um, from Australia. And I ended up teaching English to an entire department of engineers. Um, and I had the head of infrastructure as one of my first students. And he came in and he was explaining to me why he hadn't done his English homework. Um, he said, well, listen, you know, I was up all night responding to an incident. We had a DDoS attack. I said, okay, no problem. Your, your homework was to explain something specific about your job, so we're going to do that today. And he said, you're not going to ask me to explain a DDoS attack in English. I don't, you know, I barely have the words. I said, that's what we're, exactly what we're going to do. So he spent 15 minutes um, in a mix of French and English basically explaining to me that if you have a lot of computers... Okay, but not actual computers. Okay, they might not be real computers. And all at once, they send a bunch of traffic to one server that you could crash a website. I started to ask him questions. I said, how many computers? I said, how much time? What sort of websites could we take down? Um, and quite inadvertently, he gave me a, a, you know, a sort of intrigue uh, into the industry and how things could work. Um, so when I joined Screen, uh, one of the first things I said was, okay, we agree if I join a security company, you'll teach me how to do some cool things. Yeah. And the CTO said, well, listen, I can't explicitly hand you the tools um, to doing anything illegal. Of course, we wouldn't do that. But if by chance, over time, you know, we taught you enough that you then went and made a decision on your own, that would be fine. Um, so my favorite hack night was DDoS, um, uh, learning how to execute a DDoS attack. I was very disappointed to learn that for a very small sum, I could actually just pay somebody to do it. I know. It was, it was, it was very sad. I wanted to do it myself, but also not go to jail, right? Which is sort of the story of my life. Um, you know, conflicting desires, conflicting desires. So apart from the hack nights and the cookification, um, we have a great onboarding for security. Um, we use uh, PagerDuty has a really great phishing training, if you've ever seen it. Very interactive. Basically, phishing or not phishing, um, which is good fun for teams. Everybody can play. Um, and it came in handy, actually, last night. Um, so every quarter at Screen, we do a Q3 of a, a quarter release demo day. Okay, So whatever the teams have been working on for three months, we invite customers, uh, we invite prospects, we invite our investors, we invite the general public to come to our offices and to basically see what we've worked on for three months. Our co-founders are formerly uh, from Apple, okay, so there's a little bit of that echo there as well. It's a big day. It was last night. Um, I was watching remotely from my hotel room in Amsterdam, um, and right after um, we finished the demo, I received an email from uh, Pierre, our CEO, uh, subject line urgent, um, hey, Alison, do you have time to do something really quickly for me by mail? Okay. 
Earlier that morning, Pierre had actually sent me an email that was very similar to that. Okay, we were trying to close a vice president of marketing in San Francisco who needed to give notice by 3 p.m. CET, okay, and we had all these things moving around. San Francisco wasn't awake, couldn't call our lawyers, couldn't get board approval for shares and things like that. Um, it came in handy that I'd had this fishing training pretty recently. Um, it also came in handy that one other piece that I'll talk about, which is um, emotional intelligence, okay? Say if I were a highly strong, type A, overachieving HR manager, there's a chance that seeing his urgent email at 11 p.m. last night when I'm traveling um, would have sparked something, okay? It might have sparked my fear that I'd done something wrong, um, or it might have triggered my imposter syndrome, or it might have triggered me into saying, okay, whatever it is, I need to drop everything and do it now. Thankfully, I am none of those things or at least I'm aware of those things, okay? And so the first thing I did, obviously, was text him and say, hey, Pierre, and looked closely and saw there was an extra R um, in Pierre in his mail. In another company, uh, without that kind of fun, memorable uh, phishing training, I probably wouldn't have made the, made the link. I also did that training 16 months ago. Um, it turned out everybody in the company had received some sort of a phishing email right after our demo, which if you want to know if you're doing interesting things, that's a good, good validation that we were doing interesting things and then our Q3 demo was quite a success. Um, I won't say any more. If you're interested, come and see me later. Um, we also offer, in addition to this type of training, we also offer a cross-device password manager as a perk. Um, because we don't hire a lot of security professionals, 90% um, of the employees at Screen had never worked in security before. Okay, We have a very small team of security engineers, three people. Everyone else basically is either a software, um, software engineer sales team member, products, um, or support. Um, we do that on purpose, okay, because we're not building um, in the old way of things. We're building in the new way of things, okay? So everybody's uh, starting out in security, which means we carry a higher risk, which means awareness and training is big for us. But the most powerful thing security teams and HR can do as a group effort is to establish a security-first culture, I might just like just a little parenthesis here. What is culture? Because people get really confused about what it actually is and isn't. What is a company culture? Any ideas? The norms and basics. Okay, the norms, the basics, absolutely. Values. The values. Everybody understands values because they feel like they have to follow it. Okay, okay. Internal motivation, okay. It, it feels like the right thing to do, okay. Attitudes, yeah. Goals, yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, Netflix uh, defines it pretty well. Um, they say it's basically what gets uh, rewarded, tolerated, and punished. Okay, what are the things, so the norms, so what just goes on all day, every day, and is okay? What sort of jokes can I make in the open space without retribution? Um, who gets promoted, who gets fired, and why? Who gets hired, who doesn't, and why? Having a security-first culture um, sounds like maybe we have like a multi-door system at Scream with like retina scanners, right? Security first, all right? Everybody through here um, that we keep our office address offline. You know, nobody knows actually where we're hiding out doing the security. Um, that we keep out all of our Apple accessories under lock and key at all times. That we have a strong email filter. Um, on that subject, one of my very first, I'm so excited you got to use your sign, 10 minutes, 10 minutes team. <laughs> That's all right. One of my very first HR jobs, I worked in an oil and gas company in Australia. Um, I was charged with implementing a new parental leave policy, um, including the establishment of lactation rooms in our headquarters. Um, every week, I would have to go to the IT department and ask them very nicely if they would release my very safe for work emails from the national Breastfeeding Association of Australia that were being caught in the email filter every day. Um, this, as just as a side note, this is why we need more diversity um, in software engineering and security teams because these types of filters are being set up by a certain population and legitimate things get caught. So my first, uh, my first entry into the security world was: uh, Can you explain to me why this email containing um, potentially a uh, Pornography should be released into your care, which was good fun. Um, here at Screen, here at Screen, we have a security first policy, but an open door policy as well, which means you can walk into either of our offices in Paris or San Francisco if you need a desk for the day. And I encourage you, if you are in either of those cities, to come and see us. We'll give you Wi-Fi. You'll be able to see our dashboards uh, in real time. You can see our revenue. You can see our number of customers. 
You can see the bugs we're currently fixing and which agent they occur. You can hear our conversations. You can see our uh, sprint board. Um, that's something that we do very openly. Our CEO has been known to meet uh, direct competitors um, at events not dissimilar to this um, and explain our entire 18-month uh, strategy. Okay? We are a very open company for a security company for one reason. We believe in value, okay? and we don't think that secrecy or fear is the way uh, to a more secure future. We believe openness, okay? sharing, human vulnerability that leads to less system vulnerability. Um, our number one defense against attacks, actually probably our number two defense, our number one defense against attacks is our own product screen. Um, our number two defense, psychological safety. Okay, who here knows what psychological safety is? Yeah, what is it? It's tough to define, actually. Yeah, thinking you're secure. Okay, thinking that, yeah, okay, thinking you're secure. It's the belief that you can take a risk or make a mistake without being punished. Okay, it doesn't mean that there, aren't, there isn't a flow on effect, but that you won't be punished for taking a risk or making a mistake. Who here in this room has already personally fallen victim to a phishing attack? Yeah, okay. Is that a difficult thing to admit in a security conference? Yeah, it can be. It can be, right? It can be. Um, my feeling is the real number is actually a little higher than hands that were raised. Um, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't necessarily, I've tried, but we haven't necessarily established a culture of psychological safety here today. Give me another half hour and maybe I will. But basically, if uh, we have a lot of cultures in engineering and technology and security that are very, um, based on the fact that our knowledge will protect us. Okay. We are good at our jobs. We are smart. We are smarter than most. Okay. There's no way I would fall for something like that. I have such good training. Um, I work with an excellent security engineer, Cedric, um, who just built an incredible POC that if you're interested in, I can tell you more about. But he basically worked for Apple for uh, about 10 years um, and did some of the first jailbreaks um, on the iPhones. And he's the first one to tell you um, that it would be so easy. Um, to get him in a phishing attack, I like to be able, like I would be able to get him to click like concretely. I know exactly what I would do if I wanted Cedric to click on a malicious link, and I've told him. I said this is how it would happen. Cedric and I share a passion for hard metal, um, and we often go to concerts together. Okay, super easy. Hey Cedric, I just took a ticket for this concert. If you're interested, click the link. Buy one too. Okay, super easy. Because why? Okay, closeness, vulnerability, also um, feeling of belonging things like that. He now um, only ever buys his own tickets and tells me he'll meet me there, but uh, that's a different story. <laughs> um, psychological safety is required, okay? You're fooling yourself if you think you can have rules and punishment and also have a secure um, technology um, uh, company, uh, anything like that. The ability to say, hey, JB, uh, our CTO, I think I downloaded a harmful file yesterday when I was traveling. Um, ugh, can you take my machine and look, I changed my password already, but can you just see what happened? And know that I won't be punished. I won't be ridiculed, okay? Um, and that at the end of the day, um, it'll be used to teach other people something. Um, beyond just the impacts on security, a great company culture is one where speaking up is routine, okay? There are a lot of um, professions around the world where if you can't speak up and say that you've made a mistake, people might die, Okay? The medical profession, if you can't speak up and say, hey, I have a bad feeling about that surgery yesterday, I think we should go back in. Okay? You need to be able to speak up and the risk of looking dumb. Okay? I think this might be the hardest part um, in technology and security companies. The ability to look dumb. Okay? Who, who recently looked dumb doing something? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a great feeling, right, when you're an adult. You kind of hoped you might have left. Some of, maybe some of you like it, apparently. like looking dumb. I like it. This is great. Security first, looking dumb. I don't love looking stupid. Um, unfortunately, life tends to lead me to a lot of situations where that's the case. Um, I recently learned how to ride a motorcycle. Um, now, I hadn't ridden a bicycle in about 15 years, and I don't have a driver's license, um, so this was possibly an ill-advised uh, ill adventure. But my very first lesson, um, the teacher was like, I knew you we were a beginner, but like, 
how do you even just walk around? You have no sense of balance. And I said, okay, look, excellent, great. 30 years old, uh, you know, can't do what most toddlers are doing, uh, doing very well. So that was humbling. That was very humbling. Um, looking dumb uh, is something that we should cultivate, and it should happen so regularly in our organizations where in every meeting we can say, hey, Jim, our VP of sales, uh, I'm sorry, I know you've told me 10,000 times what ARR is, but I, I still can't remember. Okay, which one is that? Or conversion rates. We use a lot of acronyms. And what tends to happen in rooms full of smart people is we smile and nod and go, okay, I'll go and look that up later. Okay, I don't want to look silly in front of all these smart people. They hired me. They think I'm as smart as them. I encourage you to do the opposite. I encourage you, particularly for your leaders, in meetings like that where there are you know, a bunch of different people, one simple thing we do is anytime an acronym is used in a team meeting at screen, one of the leaders says, oh, uh, sorry, Jim, when you say ARR, you mean annual recurring revenue, right? And it stops maybe the first, you know, the most junior employee or the most recently arrived from having to do it. But because they've seen the leaders do it, okay, it's fine. It's normal. Um, so we do a lot of things publicly to make sure that that becomes a norm, okay? That becomes the right behavior. Um, we, we share on our site channel screenshots saying, hey, team, be careful. I think this was a phishing email, okay? We share that, and everyone kind of claps, and everyone's like, wow, good catch, great. Okay, we'll go and have a look. Psychological safety is the ability to be vulnerable, okay? If you want to remember one thing about the talk, psychological safety, the ability to be vulnerable. Vulnerability in humans is good for avoiding vulnerabilities in your systems and technology, okay? Vulnerabilities, okay, OS top 10, bad. Human vulnerability, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? All right. It sounds like um, your, your topic went straight into a lot of Dr. Brene Brown's work regarding vulnerability and stuff, which is awesome. And so I'm wondering how you would recommend applying that to or scaling it to a huge company, mm. or if you have 10,000 people in mm -hmm. you know, a HR department, how is that something that you can bring to them in the same powerful way? Okay. I repeat the question for the video, correct? Yeah, fabulous. Okay, so the question was some echoes of Brene Brown's take on vulnerability, which, by the way, I'm hugely flattered. Um, big fan of hers, so love that that's coming through. Um, the question was, how can you scale um, this sort of thing, or how can you roll it out across a 10,000-person company as, a, as opposed to a 50-person company? Yeah. Um, I think it comes back to the same things. It comes down to things happen very quickly. Um, so we speak English in the office, despite the fact that like 70% of the people are French. Um, it takes one conversation in French in the open space for that to catch fire and all of a sudden everyone speaks French all day. There are certain things that have like an exponential impact. Um, so it's things like in that big organization, it's obviously leadership alignment. It's saying, hey, we're making vulnerability, human vulnerability, a hallmark of how we hire, how we onboard, our employer branding. Um, this is where HR can kind of go full employee cycle, okay, and roll that out from, hey, the messaging we do about screen is not, we are the best company in the world. Um, there is one company who does that messaging, it's Twitter. Um, I would not necessarily think that Twitter actually has a great psych psychological safety culture from what I can see from the outside. It's very hard when you have claims like we are the best, okay. At screen we say, hey, we're doing a bunch of things that we think are pretty interesting but there's a chance there's things we're not doing. Come on in and help us learn about them. So I think it's across that whole chain, leadership buy-in, and the, I come from a background of change management. It's always about figuring out who the influencers are. Um, and if you find in a 10,000-person organization that your main influencers are the opposite of the culture you're trying to instill, there's two options, right? Uh, one of them is clean house, um, and, and, and the other one is accept that your culture probably won't change. Thanks a lot. Thanks, team.